Hi, this is Paula Gloria, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole. It's called that because I like to go into topics more deeply, and now I can say we like to go into topics more deeply, because thanks to YouTube, I have the benefit every day of having comments on what I'm doing, and we can both work together to go into the topics more deeply. Today, I'm very honored to have with me George Stoney. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. And George Stoney is a stalwart member of the public access uh, paradigm, I'd say, right? You and Sidney Dean were responsible for bringing us the opportunity to have a voice. One of many. I know you're very humble, yeah. but uh, you've, you've seen so much and experienced so much that I'm hoping to go into it more deeply today with you. What I'd like to do is start off with... Um, the comments that George Stoney was not able to give at the hearing for the renewal of the Time Warner franchise. So I'm going to read it, Thank and you. then we're going to go into it Good. bit by bit okay. because it's very rich. Uh, this was the testimony to be delivered before the New York City Council hearing on franchise renewal for cable television, uh, the 7th of February, 2008. My name is George C. Stoney. I am Goddard... Prof Goddard? professor of cinema at New York University Tisch School of the Arts, where I have been helping young people to recognize their social responsibility as media makers since 1970. Shortly after coming to the university, I joined a group of visionaries who saw in the emerging cable technology great potential for civic education. They were instrumental in persuading the Federal Communications Commission to issue a limited mandate that space on cable systems be allocated for public use. These were then incorporated in the city's first franchise in good part through the advocacy of Sidney Dean and other members of the City Club of New York. For the next 20 years, the cable company Teleprompter ran public access. Studio use was limited and expensive. There was little effort to educate users. Nevertheless, some organizations, notably the City Club, working from rented studios, created a source of programming called Channel L that demonstrated what public access could be with more support. Meanwhile, Professor Red Burns and I established at NYU the Alternate Media Center, where we developed policies and models for the operation of access centers in the places where cables were being laid across the country. Today we have the satisfaction of being in touch with literally thousands of such centers, most of them linked by the Alliance for Community Media. Finally, in 1989, I think it was, Sidney Dean and the City Club, with others, persuaded the City Council to put public access into the hands of an independent, non-profit entity, as it was then in hundreds of other places. So, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, MNN, was established. Um, it goes on. Governance of the access channels and operation of its studios and facilities was put in the hands of several borough presidents. Um, a truth Messenger, then president for Manhattan, declaring that programming and operation of the studios would be free of political pressure, and so it continues today, as I can it's attest. attest a longtime board member for MNN as a longtime board member. More and more as I watch channels 34, 56, 67, and 57, I realized that we have now very nearly what I dreamed it could be back in 1970. Notice, if you will, the variety, capital, of the faces and voices, the number of teenagers, the number of people my age, the number of people speaking languages other than English, the number of cultures being celebrated that the commercial channel channels ignore as unprofitable. The people on our screens are the kids in our neighborhood school, the people in our church, the people who live down the block. In sum, during its short life, public access has made New York a more humane, a more livable city. It deserves to be maintained and expanded. Well, thank you so much for allowing well, me to um, read this. I wish you could have delivered it. Yeah. 
Well, we're delivering it now, yes, yes. and it will be up on YouTube. Yes. And I want to ask you some questions because um, I'm a California mm -hmm. person, and uh, when I was in India for four years, I took it for granted that public access was everywhere in America. And I remember coming back, and you you said that it was always touch and go. What is the City Club? The City Club of New York is a group of, of businessmen and, and who have uh, public concerns as well. And they realized mm -hmm. that uh, the health with, of the with community? With Sidney Dean's help. I see, I see. He was an advertising executive, but he was also a, a sincere uh, supporter of democracy in right. the city. Right, And the feeling was, to have a real democracy, the citizenry needed to be informed. Mm -hmm. And I also remember reading in the carbon copies, the typewritten pages, which you don't see nowadays. I mean, it was uh, it was like oh, touching his archives. Yes. yes, yes. He was talking about coaxial cable, and I haven't heard that term for a while. But he was still describing the internet as we know it today. He saw that 25 years ago. He did. Did he inform you of it, or what was the group like? Oh, what were... uh, he was. Uh, I met him when I first came to NYU, and he lived in Washington Square North. Yes. And uh, we sh we shared the same interests, and he became a good friend. I can imagine. And I learned a great deal from him. You you came uh, mostly from the arts in documentary film producing. I came from film producing, right? Uh, educational films, and uh, uh, for the most part. And his concern was um, that public access be like or cable become like a utility, right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that vision? Well, he knew that. Uh, with the, the the dominance of television at the time, that uh, the chance for people to speak for themselves would be very limited, unless special uh, concessions were made. And uh, as he watched what Red Burns and I were doing with people who interns who came from all over the country, he realized that uh, that experience. It could could help the cause, and, and so also he he often came to our workshops and came to my classes. He died about uh, what four or five years ago. Yes. Yeah. Nineteen ninety-seven. Yes, nineteen ninety-seven. It was one year after the Telecommunications yeah. Act, which I think yeah. took away far more rights than people uh, realize. Right. But I would imagine uh, when you said that your work would help his cause, I can also see how his work would help your yeah. work reach more people. Very true. Because the original show that I wanted to do with you, and I hope you can come back again, was um, All My Babies. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in Ayurvedic medicine, traditional approaches, and I'd wanted to do a role in showing uh, an Indian midwife uh, being next to the fire uh -huh. and using smoke and, uh -huh. and the way they mm -hmm. heal. Because I was struck in your film, which I had to go to the library to see because it was on 16 millimeter, um, how in one of the homes they actually had a wood burning stove, mm -hmm. which you just never see today. Well, that film is now available on DVD. Oh, wonderful. Beautiful DVD. They went back to Museum of Modern Arts, uh, 35 millimeter copy. And uh, it's, it's just a, a, a lovely production. Okay, then what I'm going to do is get a hold of that DVD, and I'm going to make a surprise for you. Uh, and then <laughs> if you're so inclined, you can comment yeah. on it. Okay. But I, I feel that by understanding our traditions and our traditional methods of healing, we would all be better off. Well, now, speaking of India, uh, shortly after we made the film, and it was picked up by UNESCO and was shown around the world, and I happened to be on a plane in India and met uh, the Minister of Health from Hyderabad who right. <laughs> identified himself, and he knew the film. He said, we've been using the film. And I said, well, what language did you translate it in? And I said, people, the midwives, we use electricity and so forth and so on. And he said, oh, no, 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 we lead it in English. I said, what? He said, oh, no, we show it to our doctors because... Our doctors 
are uh, despairing of the ayahs, the, the ayahs, Indian ayahs, midwives. Right. And we want to show that in the United States, the doctors have great respect for the midwives. <laughs> well, I had to tell him that uh, the, the situation we were showing in Georgia was pretty special. Right. Can you talk about that situation? Well, the, uh, the doctors were discouraging midwives at the time. In fact, the film was made with money from the Children's Bureau of the U.S. Public Health Service, given to the state of Georgia. And uh, as usual, we ran out of money and we wanted to get some more money, so I took a rough cut up to Washington to doctor, show Dr. Elliott, who was head of the Children's Bureau at the time, and some others, and they were delighted with it. They, uh, but uh, afterwards, she said, uh, Mr. Stoney, I want you and Dr. Rice from the state of Georgia to come up to my office. And I thought, ah, oh, we're going to get the money. And then she said, well, you've done a wonderful job, but we can't let you release the film. Why not? Well, you see, we ex she said, we expected that you would do a simple training film but you've done something more. And that film, the danger of that film, is that it's going to get out and be shown in widely dispersed places. And we can't be in a position of uh, promoting midwifery because the medical profession would be down on us. We can't afford that. Wow. So you've done a good job, but I'm sorry, but we can't let you release the film. And I looked over at Dr. Rice, and he looked up at me, and then he said, Dr. Elliott, that money was given to the state of Georgia, I believe. She said, yes, yes, you have the final say. He says, Dr. Elliott, Georgia just gets blamed for so many things, I just guess we could take this one. Wow. <laughs> and we walked out of the office and he said, George, let's finish the film. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Yes. But that gets back to my point with Sidney Dean feeling that your work over at NYU uh, could help his cause. Uh, content is king. At the end of the day, people are looking at the most primitive productions on YouTube, almost even trusting primitive mm -hmm. productions because they want something authentic and something they want to watch other human beings, real human beings mm -hmm. in their real lives. And I think that's what you brought to the table. And of course, on YouTube, they want to, a chance to respond. Right. And that's something that, uh, <clears throat> when I was making for, for years and years and years, I made 16 millimeter films to be used in education, like the midwives mm -hmm. and so forth. And I always wanted to go to the places where they were being used so I could hear the audience and see what it, it did to the audience. Oh. The, I, in fact, I used to write into the contract audience tests how many I would have and where I would have them and so forth. How wonderful. Because the were... sponsor had to know that these things were, these questions were coming up. Ah. And it was a very good way to check my own uh, work as well. Wow. For those of you in my audience who don't know, uh, George Stoney's film, All My Babies, was about midwifery mm -hmm. in the South. and. He followed a midwife uh, on her journeys, you know, mm -hmm. helping instruct younger women to have healthy babies. And uh, I believe I heard you were going to follow up the babies that oh, she yes. delivered. Oh, uh, yes. How's that last going? Last fall, uh, I had a sabbatical from NYU. I went down last summer, spent a month in Albany, Georgia, where the first film was made in 1952. And then uh, my partner David Bagnell uh, and I went down for six weeks and a crew of five other people joined us and we did a reunion of all my babies. We really? found over, we had found several hundred people who had been delivered by Miss Mary and we, Mrs. Mary Coley, and we assembled them in the Heritage Museum in the old railroad station and uh, the the Freedom Singers the, from the Civil Rights Group there in Albany, uh, clad in T-shirts with a picture of Miss Mary on the, on, on the T-shirts, came in singing, we got a brand new baby, I'm coming, and that good news, <laughs> introductory song really? in All My Babies. Aww. And uh, the mayor of the town, who happens to be an obstetrician and the first black mayor, 
uh, with the, who works with midwives, introduced the whole thing. Uh, one of uh, Miss Mary's grandsons, now she was an orphan child of Georgia sharecroppers who was illiterate. Right. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at Harvard and has graduate degrees from Stanford's law school and business school. And it wow. was he who came to me and said, when the Library of Congress chose the film to be preserved for the nation, it got on the internet. Right. And he came to me and he says, George, we should do a reunion. Wow. So we did that last fall. Is and we assembled 150 people in the old railroad station for the event. Do you have, you must have footage of that. We have a lot of footage of that. I would, We're I would just like to, beginning to put it together. I would like to, if when you're ready and if you're willing to well, share some uh, of it. A couple of weeks you'll have a chance to see it because at NYU we're going to be showing some clips. So I'll give you the date and time. That would be wonderful and I'll tell you why. I was just doing a show before with some very provocative material and I was telling my viewers that I actually work with other producers and we have very different political uh, opinions mm -hmm. on things. But at the end of the day we have a huge closeness because we're creating something together. Mm. We help each other on the shows, it's volunteer. And I've often thought with the civil rights movement, what better way to have racism end than having people understand each other better through the works of artists like you? That well, instead it's... of being legislated to sit next to a black person, how about to be so attracted because you're so eager and you're so thirsty for some knowledge that that person has. Well, having lived through the civil rights movement, which right. is not over yet, right. of course. Uh, I can tell you we need both. We need legislation and right. camaraderie. Of course. But we really need the legislation as well. Right. And it we wouldn't need, have happened without that. And we need the legislation too to have public access, right? Yes, you know, absolutely. We, we wouldn't have these facilities right. if Sidney Dean didn't push for it. That's right. Do you think it would be a nice time to roll in, Sidney? Mm -hmm. Sure. If you're ready with, uh, I think it's VTR 1 or 2, uh, it's the big deck, we could roll in Sidney Dean and uh, bring up the sound, oh, just for five minutes and then mm -hmm. you can comment okay. on what he's talking about. I kind of sprang it on them hope in the my control goals. room, so it may well, take a minute or so. Completely yes, competitive, in robust and then they'll bring market the for up, content. So for speech, for ideas, for expression, for news, for information, in for education, studio. and culture. We can only get that uh, by, in the words of the Constitution, the prohibiting the abridgment of content. Now, let me disabuse anyone. That doesn't mean the duly legislated criminal content, yeah. fraud, defamation, or libel, public, uh, libel uh, infractions that uh, can be prosecuted. Right. But the, but the cable operator or the broadcaster shouldn't be the censor. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good he see. should be. Com yeah. He should have to carry everything. If it if it turns it to, after a, so a district attorney uh, Joe, is listed studio. listed for thirty it's seconds and he right. found it's de criminal by definition, yes. he can stop it. Oh, but I can't but hear. the broad but the owner of the technical facility shouldn't have that right. So down the road, um, even if it gives offense to a number of people, like some of the seductive talk on 900 if we numbers, if threw out of our libraries and off of our newsstands and off of our telephone system and off of our highways, everything that's it's going to offend some minorities, we would have no okay, freedom carry on, carry to think on. and be informed. Uh, so I, I believe practically. Broadcasting is dug you in. You want to stop the it's tapes immovable. and let's work it out? I maybe Cable now is so I rich. It. And their political roots are so... Th I really want you to hear this. All right, show us how to do it. Okay. Is Robin not there? Okay. It's, you pulled up VTR two, 1 and 2? Right. Paula, I'm yeah. rewinding the tape right now. No, don't rewind it all the way. Don't don't rewind it. It was cued, so just be careful. I got the wire. You just put oh, you got to undo yourself. Yeah. Because I really want you to hear this. Okay, I just stopped it, and that way you can cue it up when you want.
Oh, it's good to see my old friend. I was going to ask you. <laughs> Seconds, and he found it's de criminal by definition. You can stop it, but the broad, but the owner of the technical facility. We're rolling. Great. Some of the seductive talk on 900. If we numbers. threw out of our libraries and off of our newsstands and oh, off of our telephone system and off of our highways. Everything that's it's going to offend some minorities, we would have no okay, freedom carry on, to carry think on. and be informed. Uh, so I, I believe practically broadcasting is dug in. It's immovable. Cable now is so rich, and their political roots are so thick. I say it with great sadness. Kale is practically immovable. So what is the... So the alternative is not the alternative because fiber optics has made it possible for the telephone companies to remain common carriers, be available to everybody and everybody with ideas to sell as well as to get sponsored. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the, the, our hope and our target for the future. And uh, I, for one, will do everything I can to advance it. Even distinguished publishers have a problem with your thesis because they would hate to lose a lot of their classified advertising. You were an advertising media mogul. You know, I don't know what, a major newspaper has a lot of revenue from it. They don't have, the department stores have gone broke, they, so they lost a lot of display advertising. Would they be very unhappy with the, the Dean Doctrine? Well, how much money do you want to make? Yeah, right. <laughs> the newspaper industry has is con, is con, succeeded in turning itself into a whole network of local monopolies. Right, right. They are making vast amounts yeah. of money. If they have repaid their original capital investment 10, 15, 20 times over. Yes, there will be a slow attrition yeah. uh, of their capital values and of their revenue. They will adapt to it very rapidly. They're, yeah. they're, they're as ingenious as, as cable operators. So. Well, they all made this, and in the early days, they, they don't want to have any truck with even listing radio programs. Now they're communicating, yeah. they own cable companies, they own they own data banks, right? Sydney? So they, you were, they have a survive, very good survival rate. Is that what you're saying? We don't have to worry about them. Every one of them doesn't call it no longer. They're multimedia operators, yeah. even though their principal property may be a newspaper or maybe one or more television stations. They're multimedia operators. They yeah. don't make distinctions. Yeah. Say, here's a piece of piece of content. How do I get the royalty for books, tapes, records, right. film? That's their business now. It's de de the capital development of content. Now, they can dig themselves into their technical position. The New York Times, I was shocked to see, has acquired the, uh, old, the, the, the wholesale news distribution yeah, right, system right. of metropolitan New right. York. How do you like to confront going into the newspaper business in New York City and have your chief competitor own the distribution system? Sydney? Wow. That crew was called time on us. That's terrible. <laughs> okay. But you got, I want to tell you, Sydney, you said a press. So here we are back again. Any yes. comments on that? Any thoughts well, that come uh, up? Yes. Uh, Sydney was so right about, uh, it's interesting that when cable first came to Manhattan, we were so concerned about monopoly that the island itself was split into two. A teleprompter had the, the mm. south of 125th Street, and uh, another cable company had it north of 125th Street. Really? In just a few years, it was all together, and before long, uh, the one system had the whole city. Right, right. But uh, that, was, that was in our minds at the time. Wow. Um, when, he was, when he was talking about uh, these advertising people, being concerned, he said they'd they'd recover because I think the host was saying, "Aren't they going to be worried? They're going to lose business mm -hmm. with cable." What was your experience having viewed it all? Well, uh, I, I don't want it, an advertising agency, and I don't want a publication, so I just don't know. Yeah, but he seemed pretty confident that this was mm -hmm. an important. Uh, he said that broadcast was so entrenched. 
he seemed to feel that the public could never get access on mainstream broadcast. Is that did I hear him correctly? I think I think that's uh, we've that's been borne out by our own experience. Right, but then he said fiber optics was so rich mm -hmm. that there were so many opportunities. Opportunities only if the FCC allows it. What was that like to get well, them to the allow FCC, it? Well, the FCC has to determine. Uh, how that will be used. Right. And the Federal Communications Commission is looking after the interests of the public. Well, the, the Federal Communications Commission should be looking after the interests of the public. But as with all federal agencies, before long, the people they regulate begun, begin to control the regulators. And uh, almost every member of the FCC has been has some connection with, uh, in the past, has had some connection with a communications company. That's a little I think one of, the, uh, one of the exceptions was Nicholas Johnson. And uh, he was appointed to on the FCC because he happened to have run uh, uh, President Johnson's uh, uh, campaign at one time. Uh -huh. And it was Nicholas Johnson who uh, made it possible for the, we, us to bring up the whole matter of public access to the Cable Commission. Um, again, do you view yourself as an artist primarily? How do you describe no, yourself? No, I regard myself as a, an educator. An educator. I see, an educator. Uh, occasionally something that I do uh, becomes a work of art. Right. But that's almost by accident. How interesting. So your initial impetus is to educate people, to give them knowledge. Now, um, But also remember that making films and being in the broadcast industry is somewhat selfish. Um, I th it gives me an excuse to stick my nose into lots of other people's business. <laughs> It gives me a chance to meet people I wouldn't uh, meet otherwise. Right. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things I've been working on for a long time is a film called Getting Out mm -hmm. uh, about a drama group in Sing Sing Prison and its influence on people when they do get out. Really? How would I have ever met those fellas right. uh, without that? And some of them who are out now are, are my very good friends.